Welcome to Earth, A Love Story. I'm your host, Robin Lassiter. This is a special episode dedicated to experiencers specifically and to all humans broadly. I've been contacted a lot recently by folks bringing forward their very tender, terrifying, and confusing experiences and asking me what to make of them, what to do with them, and what the fuck does it all mean. People report feeling lost, traumatized, overwhelmed, and out of their depth. And just to be clear, these are people who might self-identify as experiencers or people who have had what they consider an anomalous experience. What we're talking about here is a wide range of different events. Here are a few. Near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, contact with the dead, ghost or poltergeist activity, contact with non-human entities, cryptids, angelic or light beings, precognitive dreams or visions, telepathic visions of climate disaster or nuclear war, altered states of consciousness, experiences with entheogens, or these might be people who have been broken open by something else entirely. Basically, anything that destabilizes our ontology, our worldview, our reality. This is ontological shock. And I want to expand this term to include what can happen when the trauma and grief that arises from our fractured way of life in the center of the metacrisis causes us to lose our bearings. Trauma in general. Grief in general. Reality not being what we thought it was in general. But again, this episode is specifically for experiencers and more broadly for all humans who are experiencing life on our planet during these shattered and shattering times. And I'm going to do my best to offer what I hope is helpful framework. I'm going to give you all of my tools and resources or as many as I can within the confines of a podcast episode. These frameworks and resources are what helped me cross the threshold from consensus reality, normal life, where I'd, out of necessity, had to compartmentalize the things that didn't fit into the consensus, to a life where I feel closer to wholeness, closer to an integrity of self, and an integrity of a reality that includes unseen worlds and beings, along with all of the gifts and challenges that brings. There are other tools, other frameworks. I didn't invent these and I don't own these. Take what serves you and leave the rest. And if you have great tips, please reach out to me. Let me know what they are. I'll include them in resources for other people. So here we go. First and foremost, I believe you. It was a conversation with Sean S. Bjorn Hargens and Stuart Davis where I first heard the idea of, and I'm paraphrasing here from the memory of that moment, what if we just believed people? What if we start with the idea that what people report experiencing is their best effort to describe something they actually experienced? This idea really quickly blew open a doorway in my heart mind and all of my compartmentalized interiority joined together in this big, wild, (laughs) ecstatic, liberated dance. Like, holy shit, it's all okay for this to exist at once. But it continued to work in even deeper and slower magic over time. I began to see how internalized my own system of disbelief had been, how I'd been conditioned by a materialist, rational mindset and culture to not only not believe in these experiences, but to actively scorn and stigmatize people who had them. In our culture, dreams are just annoying bullshit. But in some indigenous cultures, for example, dreams are shared daily as a sacred glimpse into some personal and collective otherworld landscape that holds gifts for the whole community. Some version of this deeply intrinsic dismissal of sacred interiority had woven its way so thoroughly into my being that I gaslit myself for years. I cut off my own knowing and my own mystical and powerful wisdom as silly. Plus, without any framework for this other landscape, because experiences happen in a variety of ways and seemingly across different states of consciousness, during waking life, in dreams, out of body, during entheogen use, etc., it can be very difficult to know with certainty what exactly happened, and even more difficult, what it meant. It's a journey of self-trust and deconditioning to begin to believe our own experience, and then we can much more easily believe the experience of others. So the first framework that I can offer is, 
I believe you, and I invite you to begin the journey towards believing yourself. Secondly, I encourage you to begin to develop the ability to hold the question and mystery as part of the journey. Rather than trying to figure out exactly who the beings who visited you are, or rather than trying to figure out why you had a prophetic dream about some horrible event that you ultimately couldn't do anything about, I encourage you to center your own stability in the inherently unstable shifting sands of the unknown. The phenomenon is slippery. That actually seems to be an indication that you're dealing with the phenomenon. It's tricky. It's bizarre. It is highly strange. It is sometimes completely absurd. Like, for example, a being who visited me in childhood seemed bizarrely insectoid, man-shaped but with an oily brown exoskeleton. My four-year-old self named him Ant-Man. And believe me, as I integrated my experiences later in life and had conversations, believe it or not, with other insectoid beings, or maybe the same one, I don't know, I definitely fell down the rabbit hole trying to figure it all out. Who the fuck are these guys? Why insects? And just as an aside, why not was their answer to me when I asked that question. There's nothing wrong with following our own journeys and our own experiences to some meaning. But first things first, ontological shock is often experienced as trauma. And we'll talk more about this later. So first of all, how are you sleeping? How are your relationships? How's your health? Let's address you first. Center the most vulnerable part of self. There will be time for deep dives into all manner of esoterica once we find foundation in the foundationless liminality. So how do we do that? How do we begin to find stability and a sense of safety as job one? It's actually really interesting because this journey mirrors others that we're already really familiar with. This is a hero's journey, or an honest descent, or a shamanic initiation, or a superhero movie. Regardless of the lens, this is a deeply human journey and a familiar human story. So with this framework, the ontological shock, or the anomalous event, or the grief, or whatever it is, is the call. And when we finally decide to turn towards this call instead of numbing away from it, we start on our journey. And the first thing that happens is we receive help or gather support. Sometimes a mentor arrives and sometimes we need to take the initiative to cultivate relationships with our own teams of allies and helpers. One of the first things that I do with every one of my clients is help them to connect with their own support system. This could include a safe friend or family member or a support group like the experiencer group or some other online or in-person community. It could be a mentor or a coach or one of our beloved pets, a bright, safe ancestor, a team of unseen guides, archetypes, religious figures, our own higher selves, all of the above, or others that I haven't thought of or mentioned here. There's actually a lot of support out there, although admittedly, it can be really hard to find if we're not yet familiar with it. But these support structures require the same relationality that we attend to in all of our other relationships. So how to put this into simple terms? I I generally suggest to people that they imagine a supportive, loving, wise, and trustworthy team around them. Just begin to experiment with how it feels to trust that there's unseen help. And then practice engaging with it. Ask this unseen help to protect you while you sleep. Ask your unseen team to support you by making your home and bedroom a sanctuary where you can truly rest and feel held and nourished and recuperate and regenerate. You might ask your team to put an invisible bubble of protection around you in your home and keep anything negative or intrusive away. Basically find some kind of boundary practice that feels natural and meaningful for you and ask for help installing it. Then say thank you. And you might do this practice a couple times a day for a while upon waking and sleeping and see what changes. And if this feels confusing or impossible or too simplistic or like it could never work, 
or if you just don't have the capacity to experiment on your own with something like this, reach out for help from your mentor or supportive community. So a couple things that come up as people approach this practice. One is the question, can this practice fit into my personal belief systems? Yes. Basic protection and boundary practices are found across cultural, spiritual, personal, and esoteric belief systems and traditions. Even here in the West, where we can often be completely cut off from the unseen world, hence the shock that happens when it arrives, we can think of the basic things that we do, like locking our doors at night, as a similar boundary practice. It's a way for us to say, hey, this is my space. Stay out, please. I'm trying to sleep. I'm trying to relax. I don't want to think about somebody wandering through the door. I'm just going to lock it. Simply knowing and stating clear boundaries can begin the process of getting some relief and developing a sense of agency. Some experiencers find empowerment, treating their relationships with NHI, entities, the phenomenon, etc., the way that they treat personal relationships. For example, boundaries are good. Boundaries are healthy. An experiencer might decide that it's not okay for something or someone to invade their body, their personal space, bedroom, psyche, mind, their personal time, their private time without consent. And they may also decide that they do want to have contact with certain entities or experiences that they've developed trust with over time. From that basic foundation, we can move to more specific practices. There are dozens of them. Some people take cleansing Epsom salt baths or ritually establish a perimeter using salt. Some people, it's purely communicating with the guides and asking them for protection from negative, unconscious, or unwanted contact. Some people set aside clear times to communicate or engage with the phenomenon instead of being open and bombarded all the time. There are many, many others. Uh, One tried-and-true method brought to us by fellow experiencer Jim, who I interviewed in uh, episode 20 on this podcast, is a hearty fuck-off. Yes, you can tell the phenomenon to fuck right off. It's okay to set a boundary. And there are all of these different practices, from the simple to the ritually complex, and all are valid and seem to offer relief and a sense of empowerment. It might not happen right away. You might have to experiment with what works for you. Even with protection and boundary practices, not all experiencers feel 100% safe and protected all the time. And it can take some time and effort and specific interventions for things to really change. But this simple practice is a great place to start. Also, I have a personal belief system based on my own experiences and experiences working with clients that when we engage with the trusted unseen world, when we invite in those beings who have our best interest at heart, when we invite in our trustworthy, supportive, protective, guiding team, they are so happy that we did that. They've just been kind of waiting for us to turn towards them and engage. They want to help us. And often the results of turning towards this unseen world with, you know, boundary and intentionality is that things change pretty quickly. That was my experience and the experience of lots of other folks. Also, what can happen with these practices is that it's extremely common for experiencers to be hesitant to set a boundary because they're afraid that if they do so, the experiences will stop altogether. And that makes sense, right? Because, and this brings us to the next piece of framing, where I want to encourage us to normalize a range of responses. Because, you know, experiencers react to a events in a wide variety of ways, and they're all valid. It's normal to want anomalous experiences to stop. It's normal to want anomalous experiences to continue. It's normal to want both continued experiences and relief from the fear and confusion and disruption that they can bring. It's normal for us to want relief from the intensity of the experience of grief, for example but also want the grief with us because it's proof of how deeply we love. Accepting our response, whatever it is, 
in all of its complexity, is a great way to begin developing agency and stability. In fact, you'll find as we move forward that we're entering into the realm of complexity, of nuance, of paradox, of both and. So this wide range and variety of responses is normal and accepted and allowed. Full permission. So now let's talk about trauma. Many people experience the after effects of ontologically shocking events as being traumatic. That was certainly true for me. Even if we ultimately end up viewing these events as positive or a mix of positive and negative, even if there are some lotuses that spring up from the mud, the trauma is real. The trauma in our bodies is real. Hypervigilance, insomnia, terror, substance abuse, isolation, questioning our sanity is real. In fact, there is an ongoing question in the experiencer world that goes something like, which came first, the trauma or the experiences? There seems to be a large number of people who have had otherworldly experiences who underwent childhood trauma of some kind. Were we cracked open by the trauma and thus have these anomalous experiences? Or is there something intrinsic within us that makes us receptive to seeing into the other worlds? and have trauma as a result of that intrinsic thing? Or is it some blending of the two? Both and. I don't know the answer to that. Again, I'm decentering trying to solve the mystery and centering the vulnerable self. How do we help the person experiencing the after effects of trauma to stabilize and feel better? How do we help ourselves find relief? And here, me and many others have found that being able to attune to another nervous system, a very safe, caring, non-judgmental friend or coach or mentor, a therapist, or even engaging with other experiencers and experiencer stories can be incredibly helpful. It's healing when we tell our stories to someone who can hold us in all of the wildness and fear and confusion with stability and spaciousness and compassion. I know that many therapists are dismissive of these experiences, and many of us have additional trauma from burying our souls in an unsafe environment that we thought was safe. I do also know some therapists who are experiencers, and if you reach out to me, I will give you their information. And I'm not a therapist, but I am a coach and mentor, and I also offer this work. J. Christopher King of the Experiencer Group offers this work. And... In addition to finding someone that you can talk to one-on-one, it seems that finding positive anomalous culture is incredibly helpful. The experiencer group and other online communities can themselves be spaces of supportive attunement, as can a great podcast. Meditation practice, yoga, somatics work, and or a spiritual system can all be really helpful. And... There's a bottom line here that we can do a lot on our own. We really can. And in our Western culture, we are expected to do it all on our own. We are immersed in a hyper-individualistic culture, and we're expected to have these full lives with personal growth and a rewarding job and a beautiful family and healthy habits like cooking all our meals and going to the gym and drinking enough water every day and raising kids and taking care of our aging parents and getting a full eight hours of sleep at night, as well as personally dealing with our roles in climate change and processing all of the grief involved with wars and genocide and the other global meta-crises that we face. But I believe that humans are meant to human together. For most of our human history, we did not do these things in isolation. And I know it can be really terrifying to return to community. And for sure, that community needs to be safe and mature, but it's worth it. Our nervous systems are meant to be in a web of attunement. We can self-regulate, yes. And we are also wired to co-regulate. If you can't find a way to co-regulate with other humans, if that feels too edgy and scary, you can co-regulate with your own ecosystem, with your pet, with a tree in your neighborhood, with the sky, nature, the earth herself unconditionally holding and supporting us through every moment of our entire lives. We don't have to ask for it. We don't have to negotiate 
for her literal physical support. We don't have to earn it. We can soften into that support and into the other resources that are available to us. And I know what it's like to feel desperately alone. I know how real that is. And I know the miracle of looking around and seeing all of what we are already held in. But if you feel desperately alone, know that I'm holding you. You're part of the web, and I'm connected to you, and you're connected to me, and I see you. I'm not safe until you're safe. And I'm right here, as many lifetimes as it takes, until all of us are safe and liberated. I'm not going anywhere. And I promise you, there are countless others who are holding you, witnessing you, doing the same. I know it can feel like it, but you're not alone. So next comes the very tender process of deconditioning. And we may experience deep grief here, realizing that the world was not what we thought it was. As we come to accept our own realities, as we come to believe ourselves more, to find support, and to venture into this process of deconditioning, We may explore shadow work, inner reparenting, inner child work, dream work, engaging with somatic body-based practices in order to heal the nervous system. All of these are great, and all of these can be really deep hard work. But as far as I can see, the only way out is through. The only way that we can make it through the difficult part is to keep going, to keep engaging, to keep looking for tools, to keep looking for the things that resonate deeply with each of us. And I want to say not everyone makes it through. People get stuck in the hell realms of trauma and grief and terror. I was. I was stuck there for a really long time, and there was no guarantee that I was going to make it out in this lifetime. I came really close to not making it out in this lifetime. It takes as long as it takes. And the way forward is through. The way out is through. Keep trying. Keep moving forward. Keep looking for the things that resonate with you that can help you heal through this process. Heal through the trauma process. Many of my go-to phrases that I've collected from my own teachers over the years are arising in my self right now. Phrases like, the fastest way to go is slow and no one rushes the warrior. This takes as long as it takes. And this entire section of the journey deserves its own episode or maybe like 20 episodes. There's so much I could say about reclaiming our true natures, about coming back into our bodies and respecting the wisdom we find there, about venturing into the shadow realms and healing our own unloved and wounded parts, about claiming our own golden shadows, how you can use lucid dreaming for healing and liberation, how the things that we have collectively pushed into the underworld often hold the key to us being able to process our journeys and stabilize in consensus reality. Like one of those things, for example, is the feminine. Again, deserves its own episode. There's so much here, so many different healing modalities and paths up or down the mountain And I'll do some episodes on these specific things. But for now, let's say we have walked through that journey. We begin to heal. We make it through. We make it out of the hell realms and begin to stabilize. And we've developed agency and we've strengthened and set boundaries. And we've gotten some sleep (laughs) and started to have some vitality in our bodies again. If we make it through the underworld of Anana's descent, basically, then we have the opportunity to claim the gifts. And again, I really want to note the community and relational piece here. Anana made it out because she set up help before she went down into the underworld. And when she didn't return, help arrived. She didn't do this alone. Anyway, if we, if we make it this far, we may begin to see the lotus in the mud. We died and didn't die. We found a doorway, as Eve Ensler says, at the very center of our wound and we may begin to see a glimmer of a pathway through to the other side. And there's a whole next section to this, and also this feels like a good place to pause for a minute. Get some water maybe, take a walk or a nap, or get some food or something that feels nourishing. And that's what I'm going to do before I dive into what comes next. 
Okay, you didn't hear me pause, but I went and ate lunch and stretched my body and put my feet on the earth and played with my dog and built up the fire in the wood stove. And now I'm back. So as we are moving through this deconditioning process, it is often a time of deep soul searching and reflection. We question who we are, who we thought we were, and who we want to be. And as we heal from the trauma and stabilize even more, we might be able to begin to see our experiences from a different viewpoint. Maybe a gateway of grief or some other ontologically shuddering and shattering event becomes an initiatory experience. Maybe we begin to tell ourselves a story about ourselves and our journeys. Maybe we move from being underneath and inside of the experiences towards some agency and empowerment as we literally rewrite our stories from a new perspective. Here, anomalous phenomenon begins to serve as developmental driver. And I first heard this frame from Stuart Davis. But in truth, much of my life had been about me going through dark nights and emerging with the elixir, the gift, the gold, the lotus in hand. Post-traumatic growth is what Western psychology calls it. Joseph Campbell called it the hero's return. Inanna leaves the underworld. And once we've survived the underworld, the game changes completely. But before I dive into this, this might be overkill, and if it is, I'm sorry, but I'm always going to center the suffering. I'm always going to center the vulnerable. I'm always going to center those parts of us that are still in trauma. So before I dive in, I want to say that we are now deeply in the realm of paradox. The post-traumatic growth that comes after the trauma doesn't make the traumatic event okay. There are times to center the traumatized self, and there is a time once enough healing has taken place to pick up the sword and charge forward, empowered by the strength that we necessarily had to cultivate to survive. One of my teachers says, it hurts more and bothers you less. As we return to our alive, human, whole selves, we gain more sensitivity and depth, not less. We grow stronger, like tempered steel, and can bear the world as it is, including the presence of the phenomenon, including ontological shock and grief and suffering, and even, totally unexpectedly, rapturous joy. We are not leaving any of it out. We don't stop suffering. Contact with the phenomenon sometimes slows down, but doesn't fully stop. And what happens is that we ourselves, our container of self becomes bigger. We become able to hold more. Whereas when we were deep in our trauma and dysregulated nervous systems, telling a story from a higher perspective about the experience would have been harmful. But now we find that storytelling can be helpful. Maybe there's a deep story here about how events that shake us loose from our stable sense of reality are actually serving us. They are helping us to evolve. They are driving our development. And once again, I'll say it clearly and loudly in order to always stay close to the reality and truth of suffering, there's a time and place for this. You don't tell a deeply suffering person who just underwent loss that that loss is actually beneficial for their life purpose. Processing trauma should not be skipped over. Platitudes are a gross response to someone shaking in fear and sobbing on the floor. And you can actually see the fuck you technique mentioned above. It's also wildly appropriate here. So, diving back into the paradox to a time where platitudes do become helpful again. Ontological shock and the phenomenon as developmental driver. As we heal from the trauma and stabilize even more, we may tell a new and empowering story about ourselves and our experiences. We may find that our lives become more metaphorical and story-like. Our lives become more dreamlike. Not in that dissociated way that happens with trauma, but in that empowered way, like when we watch The Matrix, you know? There is no spoon platitude, motherfucker. We may find that the agency we've developed allows us to move from centering ourselves as the most vulnerable one to centering the other vulnerable one. Our lenses may widen and we may decide this has all happened for a reason. And we may decide it's time to bring our own gifts forward. Or not. It's already the work of a lifetime to rescue yourself, 
Okay. So if you happen to be on that journey, or if you've stabilized on the other side of the threshold, you're not obligated to do anything further. I am reporting my own experience and the experiences of some other people who find that the journey naturally moves towards a life oriented towards using their gifts for service. Other people find that their own personal journey towards healing and wholeness is paramount. And it is certain that each of our own healing and wholeness journeys is a gift to the world, whether we continue on from there into a life of broader service or not. So let's go back to the questions I asked at the beginning. How are you? How are your relationships? How is your sleep? Living a peaceful life is a blessing to the planet and the people around you, and it is more than enough. There's no right or wrong way to do this, so please don't feel like you're failing in some kind of way if you didn't get visited by aliens and then decide to become a bodhisattva. So as we begin to tell ourselves a new story about ourselves, and as we begin the process of reconstruction after deconstruction, now is the time to identify your North Star. Why are you here? On the planet, I mean. Like, why are you here on the planet? What work do you want to do in the world? What work do you want to do in your personal, peaceful life? What do you want to create? Who do you want to create with? What do you want your homes and communities and lives to be like? You've already died and didn't die. So maybe you're sort of fearless now. Ontological shock as death practice. Another episode coming soon. Why not create something beautiful? Sometimes at this point, you also might find the phenomenon becomes a powerful ally in the creation process. Maybe you receive guidance or inspiration, continue challenges and tests, but you have the capacity to overcome them and life starts to get a lot more fun. So what is your North Star? What will you do with this ephemeral, weird, precious shit show of a life? Something cool, I hope. Tell a good story. So to recap, here are the primary frameworks and tools that I found helpful. First, I believe you. Second, get comfortable with the mystery. Next, gather allies and support, both incarnate and disincarnate. Establish boundaries and protection practices. Accept and normalize a variety of responses and know that trauma is one of those normal responses. Decondition and process. Explore the phenomenon as a developmental driver. Think of your journey as a hero's journey, the descent of Inanna, or other initiatory experience. Embrace paradox. Tell yourself a new empowering story about yourself. See how your own journey, whether you choose to move into deeper service or not, affects the world around you and has made you a better, more whole, more compassionate, more loving, more self-aware, kinder person. Reconstruction after deconstruction. Find your North Star. And that is about it for today. There's so much more that I can say. I'm sure I've left a bunch of stuff out. I'm sure I've screwed some things up, but this is as close as I can get to the primary frameworks that have helped me navigate this tremendously difficult and rich path. Moving from evolution through suffering, as the four who are one told me, to evolution through joy and creativity. The only way out is through. And... Okay, so I still think it's weird that my own co-creation with the phenomenon and the beings I communicate with results in things like books and courses, because I keep being told to teach a course about all of this, and I know that all of this, the framing and the way that I've found my way through, and it includes things that I haven't brought up here and, and things that I need to go much deeper into, but this is all the meat of my second book that I'm supposed to be writing like right now. As soon as I finished my first book, the second book was tapping me on the shoulder. The beings are like, okay, now, lots of urgency always from the beings. And it's like, really? Books? Courses? Okay. Okay. Whatever. But my, my days of fighting it are long gone. I'm, I'm really still excellent at resistance and procrastination, but the days of really fighting it and just outright saying no are over. So all of that to say, 
as cringy as it sounds to me. If you want to be on the waitlist for the course, which I call the Embodied Mystic, because I had to call it something, I don't know, you can visit my website, honeyheart.org, and sign up to be on the waiting list. You can also listen to the first 15 episodes of this podcast, which are me reading my book, Earth, A Love Story, in its entirety. It is my personal story along with my own challenges, how I made it through frameworks and what it can look like on the other side of crossing this threshold. And it's free. You can listen to it on my podcast anytime. Uh, You can also buy that book on Amazon, both paperback and Kindle. And I also have a bunch of free resources on my website that may be helpful. There's books and podcasts and things like that. And I'll continue to add things there. Um, The Experiencer Group is amazing too. And I'll put all this in the show notes so you don't have to remember it. So finally, finally, many thanks to the teachers and mentors who have helped me. I don't know anything except for what I've learned through others. My teachers are many, and I return again and again to sit at their feet. Many thanks to Morgan Jenks for our beautiful soundscapes. Deep thanks to the patrons who support this podcast. And to you, dear listener. Thank you so much. If you'd like to work one-on-one with me or learn more, please visit honeyheart.org.